connect to the Zoom room. Um, you are all on mute as you join the room, um, but we'll have a couple of housekeeping items and then we'll get started with today's conversation. All right, I think we have most people who are connected and ready to join us for today's conversation. So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Thompson and I'm the Executive Director of NASW New Jersey and Delaware. And we are so excited that you are joining us today for this important conversation on reparations and the history of it in the state of New Jersey. And before we turn it over to our presenter today, um, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, today's conversation is an hour long. We're excited to have a dialogue with you and we really hope that this is going to be a dialogue. Uh, there's gonna be some information shared by our presenter and then there'll be an opportunity for questions um, and we invite you to raise your virtual hand, the little yellow thing, or to chat uh, those questions that you might have into the chat room and the chat log um, and we will ask them uh, as we see fit. A couple of housekeeping items in terms of rules. This is a chat forum and there are lots of your colleagues in the, the room. We're gonna ask that you keep the conversation today focused on the conversation at hand and just be respectful of everyone participating uh, in today's conversation. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to today's presenter. We are so fortunate to have Ryan uh, Haygood, the president and CEO of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, join us um, on this conversation about reparations and the history uh, here in New Jersey. So Ryan, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise with us. Jennifer, thanks for the introduction and thanks to, to you all for joining us and for the chance to be here. Um, I am, as Jennifer mentioned, my name is Ryan Higgood. I have the real fortune of leading the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. We're a legal advocacy organization founded a bit over 20 years ago by Alan Lowenstein. And our mission, uh, as we think about it, is really to identify structural load-bearing walls of racial inequality that, when knocked down, open up opportunities for people of color across New Jersey in a way that will hopefully serve as a, as a national model. And so I prepared a presentation, which I love to share with you all. I love for this to be an interactive discussion. The topic no doubt lends itself to robust conversation. And I wanna, I wanna lean into to that, uh, particularly I think in this moment, which is, I've been thinking a lot about both a really precious moment, but also a painful one, right? So we're having this conversation by Zoom because we're trying to emerge from an international uh, public health crisis that has claimed the lives of more than 550,000 people. Uh, but we're also in a moment where I think the country and our communities more locally are having real conversations around race and around structural racism. And that's really what reparations flows from. So I will share uh, my screen, a couple of slides as part of this presentation. And then I would love to to really have a robust conversation on the other side of it. So can you all see my, my screen there? Uh, so I love the title of, of the conversation, A Time for Renewal, Exploring Racial Reparations in New Jersey. And what I would love to do is sort of situate us in a historical moment to talk about slavery in New Jersey. Uh, folks don't actually often appreciate the role that slavery played in the Garden State I want to talk a bit about the enduring legacy of slavery. And then perhaps most importantly, what do we do with this legacy that we have inherited, that we didn't create the challenges we see? What do we do as people of conscience, as social workers, right, um, who, have, uh, who are guided by values of inclusion and compassion and proximity? What do we do with the foundation that we have, we have literally inherited? And so I began really by thinking a lot about how we situate where we are in, in this moment. And this is a picture. As you could see, it's a picture of a, a young black boy. He's standing on the foundation that we've all inherited. The foundation you could see is cracked. And here at the Institute for Social Justice where I work, 
we think a lot about how these cracks are caused by, by structural racism, that we all stand on this foundation that has cracks and those cracks are caused by structural racism. And particularly in this moment around the coronavirus pandemic, around the police brutality pandemic, that these cracks are causing real earthquakes in black communities and in other communities of color more broadly. And we've seen this play out across the country really profoundly in the last few years. This is a, a really powerful outline of George Floyd uh, on the cover of the New Yorker magazine um, last year. It's a really powerful image. Uh, and for me, it resonates because I'm, I'm 45. And in this outline of Mr. Floyd, you'll see in the center, there's a, a white car. And then there are ultimately four Los Angeles police officer standing over a man. And that man on the ground, of course, is Rodney King. And that moment was March 3rd, 1991, when I was in high school. And you all who were um, around then remember that although there was videotape of these four officers brutalizing Rodney King, each of them were acquitted on state charges. It ultimately required federal charges to convict two of those four officers. And the reason why this is so striking is because the conversation we're having now in 2021 around police violence against often unarmed black people is not new. That this was a generation ago with Rodney King and a generation before him with Emmett Till. This is an ongoing conversation that I think has really caught real steam in this particular moment. And so Dr. King said, you know, that you don't have to see the whole staircase. You just have to take the first step. My colleague Jake uh, here at the Institute created this really powerful staircase image um, that lays out the racial disparities that confront Black people in New Jersey. A lot of our work here at the Institute is about looking at racial disparities, understanding where they come from, and then working on policy solutions to fill in the cracks in our foundation. I just wanna share a couple of these racial disparities because they will lend themselves to the conversation around reparations that will follow. So again, we have this small black boy who's at the bottom of the stairs and he's looking up at the staircase. And I think for us, the staircase is an apt analogy, right? It's a, it's a, a sort of a, it captures what life is like for all of us, that each of us has real challenges to face here represented by the stairs and challenges to overcome, that we climb stairs representing the way that we face adversity and work to overcome it. But here in New Jersey, the stairs are especially steep for black folks by the numbers. And so if you look at the, um, the second stair, you'll find a figure there, $352,000. Now that's the median net wealth for white families in New Jersey, $352,000. This happens to be the highest net wealth of any family in the country. White families in New Jersey, median net wealth of $352,000, largely connected to home ownership, right? Because home ownership is the primary driver of wealth. But if you look on the right side, so there's the VS, I'm a lawyer, right? So versus typically means a contrast. So $352,000 median net worth for white families versus $6,100 for Black families and $7,300 for Latina, Latino families. And I wanna spend some time in the next couple of slides unpacking where that racial wealth gap comes from. But before I do, I just want us to go up two more stairs. You'll see the 21 to one racial disparity. So this is the uh, Black to white youth incarceration disparity rate. 21 to one, which put differently means that a black child in New Jersey is 21 times more likely to be in prison than a white child. That's the highest racial disparity in America. And what's most striking about that disparity is that as you all know, black and white kids, black and white adults commit most offenses at the same rate. And even when there's a difference in the commission of crime, it's not at the level that would explain that racial disparity there. In fact, what drives that racial disparity there, as with the racial disparity in the first staircase, 12 to one, that's the black to white adult incarceration disparity rate, also the highest in America, are policy decisions which drive who gets incarcerated and who doesn't. 
And the way I can prove this to you is that in New Jersey, a state of 9 million people, by the state's own count, there are eight white kids in prison, eight. So less than 10, eight. And I am not, you should know, I'm not advocating for the deeper incarceration of white kids. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm saying is that when we want to respond compassionately to young people or adults who are caught in the criminal justice system, we do that. So very often, and said he's not, not like the primary drivers of youth incarceration, so not Newark, not Camden, not Trenton, not Atlantic City, other cities use station house adjustments as a practice. And this is a, this is a policy where if a young person isn't caught doing something, a police officer can give a stern warning at the curbside or at the station house and adjust those kids such that they go back home with a stern warning. But too often in New Jersey, in what drives these racial disparities is that the first instinct is to incarcerate black kids and black adults. That's what drives racial disparity. But what I want to focus us on is the racial wealth gap. Because you look at those numbers, $352,000 to $6,100. And there's a couple of takeaways. I shared this number recently at an event. And I'll be candid with you. There was a, a white gentleman in the front of the, of the um, venue. I could tell he was disturbed by the numbers because they are disturbing. Um, so and I knew he'd have a question right away at the top. So I called on him first. As soon as I was finished, I called on him. And he said, you know, one, I take issue with those numbers. Where did they come from? So this is a this is questioning the validity of the numbers, right? So what's your data source? How reliable? So I told him that comes from our more re most recent report, Erasing New Jersey's Red Lines. You'll find that number in footnotes 27 and 28, right? So now, oh, so like, okay, so now he no longer resists the credibility of the numbers. So then he goes on to say, well, listen. The reason that the racial, the reason that the uh, median net wealth of black families and brown families in New Jersey is so low is because, and then he begins to articulate that essentially those numbers reflect personal failures, right? So the reason it's so low is because black folks, and I'm not exaggerating here, by the way, so, you know, black folks are um, prodigal with their finances, right? they're spendthrifts, they don't work is hard and when they do they don't save the money they earn like so essentially saying the reason that the median net wealth for black families is so low is because there's something wrong with black people it's a personal failure but then he went on to say point three and i couldn't resist a response to this part he said and by the way i'm a white man obviously and i don't have a net wealth of three hundred fifty two thousand dollars I couldn't resist you all. I said to him, well, that, my friend, that is a personal failure, right? Somewhat tongue in cheek. But the reality is, as I'll talk more about, there has not been a systematic effort to separate white men from wealth in this state. And let's talk a bit about that. So this is a slide here that features my wife. My wife is the principal of Avon Avenue School, a district school here in Newark. Uh, this is her with the A on her shirt for Avon. She's got her fist raised. And this is a picture taken last March. It's the beginning of the pandemic at a time when the superintendent, Roger Leone here in Newark, urged all of his um, principals to dispatch the computers in the school to get them to the homes of their scholars so they could learn online at home. And so my wife, Charity, here with her team, uh, did that. They delivered every computer they had to every family, such as they got one computer to each family. But the challenge was that for those families that had more than one scholar, that meant those families had to share a computer. And you could imagine even now as we're having this conversation, how difficult it would be to share a computer. And so there's a gentleman whose name is Michael Rowe, who hosts a show called Returning the Favor, previously hosted a show called Dirty Jobs, which I love. Uh, he hosts a show called Returning the Favor, and he learned about Charity and her uh, colleagues, their effort to deliver computers. And so in an incredible act of generosity, Charity and her uh, Michael Rowe uh, gave $25,000 as a gift to Avon Avenue School. And with that incredible investment, Charity was able to buy about 125 computers and deliver to each of her scholars a computer. So there was a one-to-one -one, uh, match, kid to computer match. 
And these are two of her students who received those computers. If Charity were here, and if she uh, was able to tell the story, she would say to you, you will see a lot of things in this photo. Some of the very challenging things associated with some of the, the with this photo. And you as social workers, you work with kids often, you go into environments where you see things that grieve you, right? That, that hurt, your, hurt your heart. But she would also say to you that even though, as we all know, this is um, by far a challenging situation in which to learn, these kids are um, personifying what perseverance looks like. She say that the kid on the left with the legendary on his t-shirt looks focused and determined, right? He's made for himself a desk. The windowsill was important because he and his brother were able to borrow Wi-Fi from their neighbors, they did not have it at that time. And that she would say, so that level of intense focus could lead him to do something like become a social worker or a lawyer someday, right? The kid on the right with the yellow shirt, she would make a comment about his posture, right? That this is, he's got such a beautiful arc that you could imagine him someday performing at NJ Pack or on Broadway as a dancer or, or a performer, right? That's what, those things she would lift up, but she would also say that this picture is a lot of things, including perhaps some of the best evidence that even the most heroic acts, right? The most heroic acts from social workers uh, who are now being called to arrive in response to things that police have typically been asked to respond to, right? Even social workers are going to those situations or principals and their teams who deliver computers that even those individual acts of heroism, Michael Rowe, $25,000 Avon Avenue School, even those incredible acts of heroism are not replacements for broken systems. They don't replace cracked foundations. And ultimately what you need to do is to rebuild the foundation or you need to fill in the cracks. And those acts of heroism help to supplement a firm foundation, but they certainly cannot replace a broken foundation. And that leads me to this tweet that I offered. My colleague here, uh, Laura Sullivan, was able to take the uh, the, the racial wealth gap data that I shared with you that we previously had at the family level and break it down to the individual level. And so what she found is that the net wealth for black individuals in New Jersey is 179 United States dollars, right? That the net wealth for black individuals in New Jersey is $179, it's less than the cost of the laptop that those kids were using in the previous slide. By contrast, the net wealth for white individuals in New Jersey is $106,210. So 179 United States dollars to $106,210. And I say in the sentence at the bottom that New Jersey designed it that way during slavery. And here I want to say a few words about that design. And then I want to talk about how, although that was designed at the founding of New Jersey as a colony, that design has endured such that we have that racial wealth gap today. And then I want to talk about what I think we can do collectively to repair that harm, to fill in that foundation, and would love to get to a conversation with you. And so this is a sign a historical marker, what you find in uh, Camden near Cooper Street. And it says enslaved Africans once sold her. There were several major ports into which enslaved Africans were imported and sold. Cooper, Cooper's Ferry was one. Um, there's a, another um, in actually Speaker Craig Coughlin's district. You find them in several places in New Jersey. It's not often known that slavery took root in New Jersey, but but it did. Uh, and so this is an image I, I love to show. It's an outline of New Jersey draped in a Confederate flag. And I have found this to offend some folks who don't have the appreciation for history that I'm now going to share. So this report that I referenced, Erasing New Jersey's Red Line, has as its premise that from our founding as a colony, New Jersey created a racially exclusive system for distributing property. And that, racial exclusive system for distributing property has led to the stark racial wealth gap that we see today. 
So New Jersey provided each English white settling family at its founding with 150 acres of land and an additional 60 acres of land for each enslaved black person who worked on that land. And so by the 1800s, more than two thirds of all enslaved black people in the North were held captive here in New Jersey. And after becoming the last Northern state to end slavery formally, New Jersey then created its own form of sharecropping. We called it cottaging. And so there's a direct line from the enslavement of black people in New Jersey, then to sharecropping or cottaging, then to restrictive covenants, which dictated where black people could and couldn't live, then to the denial of home ownership opportunities through the GI Bill for returning black World War II veterans, uh, then to Jim Crow segregation, which happened in the North, not just in the South, uh, then to the practice of redlining, then to exclusionary zoning policies and predatory lending practices to today's racial wealth gap. I list these things because people think about slavery as something that was an institution that happened back then. But we don't often think about the various systems that perpetuated the system of slavery after formal slavery was ended. So there's a direct line from enslavement of Black people in New Jersey to the 179 dollar figure that represents black people's individual net wealth in the state. Uh, Amanda Gorman at the uh, inauguration of the new president, President Joe Biden, offered this incredible quote, which has really inspired me to think about this particular moment. She said, while we have our eyes on, on the future, um, history has its eyes on us. And I've thought a lot about, so what do those words mean to us? that while we have our eyes on the future to move forward, history is watching us. And I do think um, really with all that I am, that both history and the future compel us to take responsibility for the cracks in the foundations that, that we have found. There is another argument that often says, look, I didn't create the racial disparity you talk about, Ryan. I didn't own any slaves at all. My family didn't own any slaves. So why would I take responsibility for that? And even if my family did own slaves at some point, I certainly didn't. And part of what I think this moment compels us to do, both history and the future, is that we take responsibility for a thing we did not create if we want this moment to be, to be different. So we started to do this in, uh, in late 2019. We brought to NJPAC along with a number of partners Nicole Hannah-Jones, who created this really groundbreaking project called the 1619 Project. And the premise of this work is really to talk about how 1619, uh, that day when 20 or so enslaved Black people came to Jamestown, Virginia, how that moment shaped America as much as 1776. Mm -hmm. And how understanding what happened in 1619 around slavery and the enduring impact of slavery can give us some insight into how we can actually make this moment different. So we brought her to NJPAC along with a number of really powerful speakers. Uh, she spoke there uh, before a sold out audience. Uh, and she, I, had, I offered this tweet where she said uh, to, the, to the audience, she said, we were told once by virtue of our bondage that we could never be American, but it was by virtue of our bondage that we became the most American of all. She said this to a sold out audience at NJPAC. And then I said that that sold out audience, the most American of all, said back to her, uh, two standing ovations, a really powerful night. She goes on, as you all may know, to win the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and then she gets excoriated by the, the past president. And then more recently, she was offered a tenured position at the University of North Carolina and this, the, the, the board of North Carolina walked back the tenure offer in response to her telling the truth through the 1619 Project. And I'm going to say more about that in the Q&A. And so shortly after she um, spoke to us at NJPAC, we joined a number of really courageous legislators in Trenton to introduce a bill in New Jersey that would create a reparations task force. So this task force would do two things. First, it would take a look at New Jersey's role in slavery, just as I 
outlined it for you. And then this task force would also set forth policy recommendations around the kinds of things that New Jersey needs to do to build a new foundation and to repair the enduring harm. A related piece of that is, and what kinds of investments should New Jersey make in institutions to repair that harm? Um, and so this is a, a picture of that day, that press conference when the legislation was introduced. Um, and then we began really, to, we launched a campaign called Say the Word, Reparations. And this was really inspired by a conversation that we had with the speaker of the New Jersey Assembly. His name is Craig Coughlin. Uh, in a conversation with him, we were asking him to help move this bill. Uh, at, the, at the time we met with Speaker Coughlin, no other state in the country had ever created this kind of task force. And for you all who've worked with elected officials, you know that when politicians often don't want to do something, they create task forces, right? They create a task force, that task force produces a report, that report goes on the shelf where it sits, right? But we thought given how complicated this issue is and how, how major, how vast the undertaking is, that a task force is actually the most thoughtful way to get at this conversation we're having. Questions around what does reparations look like and to whom and over what time and how do you decide? All those very uh, thorny but important questions could be answered by a very thoughtful group of people from all walks of life and all areas of expertise to really dig into that question, which is why we push for a task force. At that time, again, no state in the country had ever passed this kind of bill. We thought it would be important for New Jersey to show other states how you really grapple with this conversation around race and slavery and repairing harm. So we shared that with Speaker Craig Coughlin in that conversation. He said, you know, but why, like, why do you need to have the word reparations in the task force? Like, why can't we call it a, an economic justice task force? Why can't we call it even a, a Black Lives Matter task force? Like, why do you need the word like rep, like reparations, Ryan? Like you say that word, it's as if you said a curse word. Like it, it unsettles people, right? People automatically think you're gonna take something away from them that they deserve. Like reparate, I just don't see it. And I said to him, Speaker Coughlin, the fact that we're asking you for a task force is itself the concession, right? This is, a, this is a task force to finally have a conversation we have been unwilling to have around repairing the harm. So the task force has to be clear about what it is. You can't be clear about what it is if you don't include the word reparations. As a result, that bill hasn't, hasn't moved. It was introduced in 2019, again in 2020, and it hasn't moved. So we've launched this campaign called Say the Word, Reparations. And the, the idea is to take ownership of what we're trying to do, right? Some years ago, people wouldn't say Black Lives Matter, right? And now you see people with Black Lives Matter signs all over the place, even Black Lives Matter bumper stickers. But the question really is, but how do you make Black Lives Matter really? And how do you make Black Lives Matter through policies and practices, through investments? And I don't think you can get there without saying this word around reparations. There's a related bill at the federal level that was introduced by Representative, late Representative John Conyers more than 30 years ago that would do the same thing at the federal level. And so we've been pushing for New Jersey to be ahead of the curve on passing this bill. When it was introduced in New Jersey, again, no state had passed such a bill. In the meantime, in 2020, California, inspired by the New Jersey bill, introduced and passed uh, its own reparations task force. So New Jersey won't be the first, but we can certainly, with our collective advocacy, become, become the second. A few weeks ago, that bill at the federal level began to move uh, in Congress. And so we launched this campaign called Say the Word at 400yearsnj.org. There's a tool that allows for folks to interact with their elected officials directly, members of the state legislature and Governor Murphy. And this is a critical year because in this year, Every seat is up in the legislature, 120 seats in the state legislature, in the assembly, in the Senate, and the governor's running for re-election. So 400yearsnj.org allows you to interact with your elected official directly to urge them to support this bill. Speaker Craig Coughlin, who had some, has some reluctance about moving the bill, 
in his district, you'll find Perth Amboy. And the irony is that it was Perth Amboy that was one of the most major uh, ports for moving enslaved Black people through New Jersey, right? So the irony that he's resisting a bill that would even have that conversation is something that I find striking, but we can also, I think, overcome that with our collective advocacy. A few more slides. We hosted a, a press conference for a, a very diverse group of faith leaders from various traditions. Uh, Reverend Bishop Stokes, who's the 12th Bishop uh, of the Episcopal Diocese of New Jersey, which includes Speaker Coughlin's district, said, said this during the press conference. After more than 400 years of hideous wrongs, it's time to face and repair the enduring harm of slavery. This is Bishop Stokes here, the second from the left. And Bishop Stokes led in his diocese the effort to create a reparations task force to understand his church's own role in advancing slavery. And then during that press conference, Reverend Anya Samler, who's in Montclair of the Unitarian Universalist Church said this, everyone in New Jersey, Jews, everyone in New Jersey has benefited from or been harmed by slavery. I have benefited. Governor Murphy, you have benefited. Speaker Coughlin, you have benefited. She concludes, New Jersey must pass the reparations task force bill now. And so I will close by uh, inviting you all to join us this Saturday. So this is the first uh, year when New Jersey is celebrating Juneteenth as a holiday. So we're both commemorating Juneteenth as a holiday by hosting a rally and a march to pass the bill, which is S322 and A711, to create a reparations task force. So we'll meet here in uh, Newark at 12 at the Lincoln Memorial. We'll have some speakers join us, and then we'll um, march about half a mile. If you're trying to get to your 10,000 step goal, this is not going to help you. It's too short, Jennifer, of a, of a walk. Um, but at 1.30, we'll then rally at Newark City Hall uh, for this bill. We have a great lineup of speakers, including the mayor of the city, uh, Mayor Baraka. We have uh, Senator Cory Booker, who's supporting this legislation at the federal level, uh, Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver, uh, Congressman Bonnie Watson Coleman, and Congressman uh, Donald Payne, uh, Shavonda Sumter, who's one of the key sponsors of the legislation, and a number of faith leaders and other advocates and, and partners. So if you have time on Juneteenth, this is a great way to make the Juneteenth holiday really concrete in a specific effort to move New Jersey in a way that becomes the second state to pass this kind of kind of law. And finally, I end with a quote I love. You know, this is a Dr. King quote, one of my favorites. You know, he was asked, you know, what is it, you know, essentially what does it mean to, to win? Like in the end, what does a win look like? You know, and what is the beloved community, what does it look like? And he said, the end, is reconciliation and the end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. And I think folks have said, you know, this moment, the George Floyd moment, the coronavirus moment, the structural racism moment, like this moment has to be different. And it can be if we're willing to have conversations that we previously haven't been willing to have to create this end around reconciliation and redemption, and I would offer, and repair. And the end, then, is the creation of the beloved community. And I thank you for your time. I'll pause there. Look forward to, to your, your feedback. You can come, come unfiltered with you. You won't hurt my feelings, I promise you. Thank you so much, Ryan. There's a lot to unpack there and lots of questions um, coming in via chat and Facebook. Um, so certainly a conversation that is needed, um, one I'm not sure we're going to get through in the next 25 minutes. <laughs> we could probably spend another couple of hours talking about it. Um, I think one of the things, uh, the questions that we have gotten, and we get this quite a bit, um, and I guess we'll just start there and dive into some of the other questions, but curious of your thoughts on what, just what are reparations? What does this even mean, right? Like, I think a lot of people hear the word and you said, you know, it is unsettling that the speaker said it's unsettling, it's jarring. 
And I wonder if that's just because people don't understand even the general idea. Can yeah. you provide a definition for that? Yeah, sure. So one, you know, I do, I really want to just thank you and the association for having this, this conversation, because I will, I will say to you in the full interest of candor that, um, I, you know, I, I think about this a lot. This is what I, this is what I do. This is my work. So I, I talk about it often, but you know, there are conversations that we just don't often have because they make us so uncomfortable. And I think of all the conversations around race, reparations is probably the most unsettling um, because at its root, the word reparations has repair. And very often when people think about the word reparations, they automatically go to a, a financial investment. And they often think that the financial investment means that it's going to take away something that they have, that they work very hard to get. And then it leads to, a, and if those seeking reparations would just do the work I did, they wouldn't be asking for what ultimately uh, would result in a handout, right? So reparations to me most basically is about repairing the harm from a system that created those racial disparities. At the, at the national level, Jennifer, at the national, so the racial wealth gap is really the heart of reparations, right? If you don't have, if you don't have financial stability, that leads you into, very often we have these conversations that are often in the criminal justice space, right? Criminal justice reform, but criminal justice reform is triggered when the economic justice conversation isn't had. And that's really the heart of inequality in my mind is around economic justice. And so very often when we talk about reparations, I think it unsettles white folks in particular and black folks too, who often wonder, well, how would you administer rep like as a practical matter, assuming we got it, what would it look like? And they quickly think, well, it'll be a check, right? And folks are unsettled by the idea of a check because they think, well, one, folks don't earn the, they don't deserve the check. And even if they do deserve it, they'll be prodigal with the check. And so I resist reducing reparations to a check writing exercise because doesn't matter the amount of the check, you couldn't write a check big enough to fill those cracks in the foundation. So for example, at the federal level, it would take, at the national level, it would take 228 years, so a century plus, for Black families to achieve the level of wealth that the average white family has right now. Right now. And if current trends continue, the median net wealth of black families nationally is projected to fall to zero by 2053. But it's not because black folks aren't working hard. It's also not because we don't have some incredibly successful black folks. It's because there have literally been, as I outlined in the presentation, intentional attempts to separate black people from wealth. And so what reparations really means is one, an acknowledgement of that reality, that the racial disparities we see, like is it, could, could black folks save better or be better with their finances or make better choices personally? I, obviously we all could do that. But even if, if black folks exercise the greatest discipline in every, every possible area, you couldn't close that race, racial wealth gap through individual effort alone. And so what reparations really means is that you begin to think about how you design a system that makes investments, deepening home ownership, canceling student loan debt, right? You think about ways to build wealth in communities that it was intentionally kept out of. And the first thing you gotta do is you gotta acknowledge, you gotta acknowledge, you gotta acknowledge that there's harm. And then you have to thoughtfully think about how to repair, repair the harm. That's reparations. It's not, it is not an exercise to see which white families held slaves, right? Because I'm 45, I'm imagining there are people on the line who are younger than me and older than me. None of us old enough to have been around during slavery, right? But we certainly continue to live in the legacy of slavery. And so although we didn't create this cracked foundation, I do think 
it's incumbent upon us and the prof profession you all chose, the social workers, right? this is what you do. You all step into those cracks all the time on behalf of the people you serve. That's incumbent upon us to begin to build a, a different kind of system. And the last thing I'll say, Jennifer, is the reason I resist reparations as a concept that takes away from people who already have is because particularly in New Jersey, you know, we're not a state that lacks resources. We're just not. We're the second wealthiest state in the country, second to Maryland. Right now, right now, New Jersey is projected to have a $10 billion surplus. I mean, isn't the, the numbers are incredible. You will often hear, and I know you, especially the social workers, you do this all the time, like we don't have resources to support social workers at the level we need, which is absolutely not true. There are always resources. The question is, how does the state, how do elected officials, how do people in position of power prioritize administering those resources? But right now, $10 billion surplus. Elected officials are trying to think about how to spend that money. And unless there's specific advocacy to support the things we care about, they'll find ways that don't include the things that we that we care about. So I hope that hope that makes sense, Jennifer. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely does. And you said something earlier, you know, that there's such a resistance to talking about it. You know, well, I didn't own slaves. I wasn't part of creating this problem. I didn't. And I think we have to shift that narrative, right? None of us here were part, for the most part, uh, were part of what happened in the past, but it's not our connection with that is what are we doing now to fix it, right? Are we going to be idle bystanders or are we going to be part of the solution? And I think as social workers, that's what our calling is, is our mandate with our code of ethics and to jump in and acknowledge our privilege and sit with the discomfort. We do that really well as a profession and wrestle with some of these really challenging issues um, to come up with thoughtful solutions that make sense for our communities. Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. I love the point you made because I do think, you know, like I will share with you that I, I'm uncomfortable often. Like this is my, my job, I'm a civil rights attorney whose job it is to push in a way that makes people uncomfortable. But I'm also often uncomfortable with, with, with it. And I think you can't really do the work that you all do or that I do without making people uncomfortable and by extension, making you yourself uncomfortable. So specifically this issue around this reparations task force in New Jersey, it's interesting because it, it is also a story about race. So you have people pushing for a reparations task force to study the role of slavery in New Jersey and to make recommendations about how to fix it. It is a bill that's being supported by every black elected official in the legislature, probably 20 or so black elected officials. And if you put to that support, the support of every black person in New Jersey, it wouldn't be enough to move the bill. It wouldn't. In fact, I think every social movement or every movement for racial justice has been that has been successful, meaning moving legislation, changing policies or practice has been a multiracial effort. And so I've, you know, received lots of questions around allyship. You know, what is it what does it mean to be an ally to black people or brown people if you're not black or brown? And I think what it calls for specifically in this context is for our white allies to push our elected officials to support this legislation. So there's, you know, the imagined support coming from places like Newark where I live or Camden or Trenton or parts of Plainfield, but Speaker Craig Coffin, I keep focusing on him because he inspired the Say the Word campaign. He doesn't imagine his constituents in his district pushing him to move this legislation. And when he starts to hear, particularly from non-Black constituents who care about this task force, it'll start to move. I mean, that is a story. It's a difficult story, but that's a realistic story about the, the role that race plays, even in moving, moving legislation. And I think a real moment for us as a profession, right? There are, you know, 25,000 at least licensed social workers within the state of New Jersey, and that doesn't account for all of the rest of the social workers in every district, in every nook and cranny in our community. And we should be using this moment to show our allyship, to show our voices, to elevate this work and make sure that, just to your point, 
our elected officials in in Newark, et cetera, might know about it, but I'm guaranteeing that the elected officials in Hunterdon County, where I'm at, hear very less, <laughs> very little about this issue. And so they're not likely to move on it. And so this is a great opportunity for us to lend our voices and make sure that um, they hear from us. Yeah. You know, another question that came in, and maybe just a point of clarification, um, is just, you spoke a little bit about the $179. Um, where did that come from? How did you arrive at that? That is such a disparity. Where did yeah. that come from? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'll put in the, um, let me just grab it. I'll put in the, the chat, the link to this report that my colleague, her name is Laura Sullivan. Um, it's a short data sheet. I'll find the link and I'll put it in the chat, but it's called, it's called Black and Brown in New Jersey. And it's original research and writing that she did that looks at, so she looks at all the, all the assets that the average black person has around home ownership, savings, 401k plans, inheritances, um, and then she arrived at that, at that number. Um, she's someone who spent a number of years at Brandeis, who's really an expert in, in this field. Um, but here's the real challenge. So in New Jersey, about 40% of Black people own their homes. Um, in New Jersey, close to 80% of white people own their homes, right? So about half the number, of, half the percentage of Black folks own homes. And again, home ownership is the primary driver of wealth. And where I am in Newark, 80% of people, 8-0, 80% of the people in Newark are renters. 20% of the people then, right, who live in Newark own their homes. So one is the rate of home ownership. And again, home ownership is the primary driver of wealth. And then even when Black folks own their homes, they're not valued at the same rate. So in this data sheet, I'll put, which I'll put in the chat, it's called Black and Brown in Jersey, um, and I live in I live in Newark. You know the average home value is in the mid two hundreds. You know Milburn is uh, you know some miles away. The average the average value of home is, is about one point one million dollars there. So very low incidence of home ownership, and then homes are not valued at the same level. That's a significant driver of that report, and it's a staggering it's a staggering number. $179 individual net wealth. No words. I think all of us were left speechless to mm -hmm. when you hear those numbers. And it really does highlight the disparities here in our own backyard. And so many people don't think about our history and our connection to the state with uh, you know, slavery. And I'm just interested to hear from you. Why don't we know about yeah. our history. I feel like yeah, we think about it and we think about, oh, that's the South or even yeah. I grew up in Kansas. Oh, okay. That makes yeah. sense. But yeah. why do we talk about it in New Jersey? You know, it's, inter it's interesting. So I, I mean, I, in the full interest of candor, I'm originally from Denver, um, Colorado, and I, you know, but I've been here 20 years. Like I said, I came to Jersey 20 years ago this month, study for the bar exam. It's been an amazing reflection. Um, but one of the things I've learned about no offense to native New Jerseyans, is that there is the sense that we have always been a very, we are now and have always been a very progressive state. That historically New Jersey was a beacon for democracy and freedom and that it endures to this day, right? We have, you know, in terms of politics, there are 1 million more Democrats than Republicans, you know? So I think we think a lot about being liberal and progressive. And I think in some ways on the politics, we are more liberal sounding than some of our you know, brothers and sisters in the Southern states. But I think there's a, there's a sort of a mismatch of sort of how we see ourselves in the state and who we actually are. You know, we are a couple of things at the same time. We're one of the wealthiest states in the country um, and that wealth exists alongside some really punishing poverty, right? see the racial wealth gap. We're, we're one of the most racially diverse states in the country. And that racial diversity exists along some of the most entrenched racial segregation. One anecdote on that point is, you know, that I mentioned that my wife is a school teacher. This is a 25th year teaching in Newark. She taught in three different schools in, in the South Ward of Newark, 25 years, thousands of kids. 
She's never had a white student. Right. And, and, and for the educators in the line, you, and you know, you, 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 that's not, that that's not, you know, it's not uncommon that we do live in areas where, you know, we exist, our lives are defined by race, they're drawn by race. And so I think New Jersey is kind of like Dr. King talked about the two Americas, you know, that there's an, there is a New Jersey where kids do grow up in the sunlight of prosperity, but there's another New Jersey where kids, very often kids of color, are separated from that sunlight and, and that's just a reality. So I've been in conversations with people who, you know, when, particularly when I show the image of the Confederate flag over the state, like they're like, that's just, that doesn't feel right. And to your question, Jennifer, I think the reason we haven't really dug into the history is because we know that if we do, one, it makes us uncomfortable, but then two, we're responsible for doing something about it. And that's kind of where we are in this moment. Uh, I, it is such a moment of opportunity, I think, as a state and as a nation for us to really do the hard work that we've been called for centuries to do, we just haven't done. And, um, but it, it's definitely, it can feel uncomfortable. And um, I think people just have to learn to sit with that discomfort a little bit and manage through it. Otherwise, we're not going to, to see the change that we really envision. Someone else had a question um, and wondered if you could speak just briefly about it, um, the work that's been done in Illinois on reparations. Uh, any thoughts on that? Is that something that we should be looking at? Yeah, it's a great, so great question. Yeah, this is the city of Evanston, I think, that a person's asking about, which um, is contemplating providing as part of reparations, $25,000 to some number of um, people connected to enslaved Black folks. And I think, um, one, I commend the city for taking the issue head on. I, um, and I don't want to diminish that effort. I think the reason I like the approach in, in New Jersey is because I just don't think you can get at, so we talked about the racial wealth gap. You know, I just don't think you can get at that you can't get at that racial wealth gap. You can't, I think, begin to close it by writing a check because, you know, I think ultimately, if we're going to do it right, we have to get at what caused the need to write the check in the first place. And that's those cracks in the foundation. And so there, you know, if, if we're talking about closing the racial wealth gap is one of the things we want to repair, then we got to think about how do you build a system that creates deeper levels of home ownership in cities like Newark, right? Where so few of the residents own their homes. And then how also do you think about people living in those homes, getting the true value of, of those homes? So I think it does, you know, and it may ultimately be that financial investments are provided, but I think there's a way to think about how you do those in a way that they advantage whole, whole communities. And so I think the approach that I, I hope to see take root in New Jersey is a really thoughtful approach that really digs into the history of Jersey and then makes a range of policy recommendations that the legislature turns into law and that the state as part of its budget makes investments to empower those policy recommendations. So I appreciate that Evanston is making steps in the reparations direction. I think that the New Jersey approach around creating a a task force gives us a thoughtful way to get, to get there. And the other I thing I'll say just on that point, Jennifer, is I think the check writing piece is also a bit tricky in the sense that now that, so on, on the other side of the checks, although the individual payments, um, folks will think it's over. You know, like we did the thing. You asked for reparations, we wrote you a check that's got to mean that the impact of slavery is felt no more. And I just don't think that structural racism works like that, you know? You're right. It, it, writing a check, um, which I think is what normally people are thinking about, at least right now uh, in terms of reparation, it doesn't get to the underlying issues that you wonderfully presented in the beginning of your presentation. It doesn't get at the huge and gross disparities of incarcerations of black and brown children. Right. A check isn't going to solve that. And until we do that work, um, 
it's it's sort of a, a I'm going to use a word that may not be accurate, but a, a bit of a payoff, right? We didn't get to the root of the issue. And I think one of the things as us as social workers, we have to be thinking about as part of the conversation around reparations is also our inherent challenges within our profession that we have in our academia, we are not talking about structural racism enough. We are not talking about the role that social workers have played in the creation of systems that disproportionately affect black and brown people. And I would even suggest even within our own testing and licensing process, right? There are gross disparities in pass rates for people of color. And how do you understand what that looks like here in New Jersey? How do you get to the systemic issues? How do you solve for those? Um, I, I hope that all of that is part of the conversation that we tackle together. And I just want to credit that, Jennifer, because I think that's the work of you know, because I do think there's a, it's kind of like an internal body of work that we, if it's an organization or an association, a community, a civic organization, a, a institution of faith, you know, I'm a lawyer, right? So I think that there are, you know, fewer than 5% of lawyers are black. You know, I started off at a law firm and as I was leaving, we got one black partner. There were, I don't think there were any like Latino or Latino partners, right? So I think that internal work in our professions, like that, that's work to be done first, right? And then there's the, and what, what, what work does our, does our profession do in the community where we are situated and at the societal level? So those levels, and particularly given the size of, of the social workers networks, there's real power there to be organized around these issues. But I do think your point is well taken, Jennifer, for the, the, the very the first part of the work is internal. And you're doing, I mean, just I'm telling you, by having this conversation alone, this is like to say the word, to have a conversation about. So what if someone will say, if asked, would you spend the last hour doing what? I spent the last hour talking about thinking about reparations. Not a lot of folks are, are doing that right now. And more are doing it now, including the president, than in the past year or two. Uh, but we're really sort of, you know, I think in the ahead, ahead of the curve on this issue. And that says a lot about your leadership. Well, I know that our community is so invested in being part of the change and really grappling with some of these issues. It is not only, I think, who we are as people, as social workers, we are committed deeply to this work, but it is the calling of our profession. Our code of ethics demands that we fight for injustices and we address systemic inequities. And it's really our absolute privilege to have you join us for mm -hmm. today. Um, we're, we could talk for another hour. Mm -hmm. We are coming up on one o'clock. Sure. Um, I wanna thank you for your time. Thank you know, you. there are certainly some takeaways. We would love to support you um, for your Juneteenth event on Saturday. So I'm gonna follow up with you Excellent. afterwards. Um, we'd love to see our social work community there mm -hmm. um, and to follow up with some advocacy work. And I think that that's something for all of you watching today, we will be following up with how you can connect with your legislators, how you can share your voice and how we can continue um, to support the work that you're doing in a meaningful way. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for the time and for the opportunity to talk about this issue. Thank you so much, Ryan. For all of you joining us, if you didn't catch all of it um, or your internet connection was bad, we do have a recording of it. We will post it on our website. It's also on Facebook Live, so you can share it with your friends there and invite them to join in the conversation. Uh, Ryan, again, thank you so much, and we will be in touch. We look forward to working together with you on this important issue, and um, we're just grateful for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you all.